Jesus' mama, Mary? You know, he'd gone home. Hometown boy makes good, comes home. You know, I bet she saw all that. I bet, I bet she was there. I mean, I know when I go home to preach, my mama is there in the front row. I wonder what that was like for Jesus' mama when everybody said those ugly things about him. Especially when they said, in he the son of Mary? In that Mary's boy? As if? You know, Joseph isn't mentioned, but, you know, if he was there, which he might have been, I wonder what that, I wonder what that was like for him. Jesus is dead. Hear people talking ugly about his boy. Or his brothers. Who were there? And his sisters. What was it like that day for the family? For Mary and Joseph and James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and the girls? What do you think? What do you think it was like for them? To hear people talking about Jesus that way. Implying that he didn't know what he was doing or he, who did he think he was? One question I have, where do you think they were on it? Do you think they also took offense at him if they were there? Jesus seems to think so. As he says, prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. The implication from Jesus himself is that even his own family and those living in his own house also took offense at him. Yeah, I think that's an interesting turn of phrase. They took offense at him. Anybody here have ever have anybody take offense at you? <laughs> I mean, not me. I just wonder because, you know, I've never had that experience and I just want to know what it is. Just kidding. Or how about you? You ever take offense at someone? Yeah? It's an interesting turn of phrase. And they took offense at him. What is that telling us more about? Them or Jesus? And they took offense at him. Who does that tell us more about? Jesus or them? Is it possible that he said something offensive in his preaching? I mean, they were astounded by his teaching. That Greek word there, by the way, literally means blown away. Blown out, thrown out. They were, they were cast out, they were thrown out of themselves. Blown away by his teaching. But maybe not in a good way. Maybe he blew their minds. Maybe he offended them with what he said. Maybe he did something that was offensive. Maybe they didn't like his robe or his sandals. You know, I can't believe he's wearing those sandals and that tunic. I mean, that's a little flashy for a boy from Nazareth. It helped if he was married because she would have never let him walk out like that, dressed that way. <laughs> You know, I don't know. Was it something he said, something he did, something about him that was just offensive? Or were they the kind of people who were just easily offended? Right? You know anybody like that who's just going to take offense at everything? You don't know anybody like that. So what Jesus said or did or was may or may not have been offensive, but maybe that is the response that they chose. Maybe that's the response they always chose. Or maybe that is just the response they chose in that moment. This interested me so much, I looked up this particular verse, which is verse 3 in many different versions of the Bible. And I just wanted to share with you a couple of different ways that people, that some translators rendered this. Uh, many of them did just say just what we had here, and they took offense at him. Easy to read version said, you know, isn't he just the carpenter like Mary's son? So they had a problem accepting him. They had a problem accepting him. Rather than they took offense at him, they had a problem 
accepting him. Now, good news translation goes a little further. Isn't he the carpenter, the son of Mary? So they rejected him. They rejected him. Not they took offense at him or they had a problem accepting him, but they outright rejected him, they said in the good news translation. Another translation said they were upset with what Jesus said. You don't know anybody who ever gets upset with what somebody says. Another translation said they were indignant at what Jesus said. One version, I can't remember which one, said they were not pleased at all with him. <laughs> I decided that if it was a Kentucky translation, it might they might have said, well, bless his heart. <laughs> you think? The 1899 Dewey Rhymes American edition of the Bible is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary. And they were scandalized in regard of him. Scandalized. Now, interestingly enough, the reason I wanted to share this one with you, by the way, Dewey Rhymes, I looked that up. That is, uh, some French Catholics did an English translation from the Latin Vulgate into English in 1899 and created an American edition. They chose scandalized. And I share that with you because the Greek is scandalizo. That's the word in the Greek. They were scandalizoed by him. And a scan, uh, scandalon in Greek is a stumbling block, an obstacle. Something you, know, you ever stub your toe? Stumbling block. Makes you trip and fall. Young's literal translation, also done quite some time ago, is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and they were being stumbled at him. They were being stumbled at him. And then, as I've shared with you many times, I, I often enjoy Eugene Peterson's paraphrase the message. Not always, but sometimes he gets it just right, and I think this is one of those times. I'm going to share that whole little section with you from the message. In the next breath, they were cutting him down. He's just a carpenter, Mary's boy. We've known him since he was a kid. We know his brothers, James, Justice, Jude, and Simon, and his sisters. Who does he think he is? They tripped over what little they knew about him and fell sprawling. And they never got any further. I don't know if Jesus' family were among those who took offense, those who got tripped up on their own prejudices and preconceived notions about what he should or shouldn't say and what he could or couldn't do. But I do know that even if they were not, I know they still had to deal with those who were. And whether or not to be offended by association with him because they were his family. So that ever happened to you? I know that when I announced to my family that I was going to be a minister, I was met with a fairly mixed response. There was some surprise and joy and delight, impressiveness. There was a lot, are you sure? <laughs> and there was a lot, you know that's not going to be easy as a woman. You know, a lot of people aren't going to like that. And I think, you know, I can't speak for them, but the sense I got that for some of them, the concern was less about being a, them being offended by me, but that they were going to have to deal with the offense of others. Right? My mom and my, my brothers, my daddy had passed at that point. My mom and my stepfather and my brothers. It was about wanting to protect me from the offense of others and, and themselves to have, you know, for them to not have to deal with the offense of others. But it all worked out great. They came around. I threatened to send them to hell and they said, fine. <laughs> Just kidding. So what about Mary and Joseph and the rest of the family? What do you think? How'd they deal with that? Well, as I pondered that, I remembered something that I experienced at General Assembly last summer when I went to the GLAD 
uh, to the Disciples Alliance LGBT plus, Q plus banquet. At that time, we were developing our open and affirm. Actually, we had already uh, done our open and affirming statement. We had unveiled it last Easter, and we were finding out about what we needed to do to be recognized by Disciples Alliance. So I went to the banquet. And at that banquet, they gave out an award called the Carol Blakely Award. And before they gave out that award, they shared this information to help us know who Carol Blakely is and why it should matter. Carol Blakely is a mom from Idaho who in 1977 at the Kansas City General Assembly of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ went to the microphone during a business session and read her son's coming out letter to the entire assembly. I want to share with you this letter, and I'm going to ask you to just bracket for a moment where we've been and just hear this letter. I'm going to tell you about why I wanted to share it. So this is Carol Blakely uh, reading her son's coming out letter to the General Assembly in 1977 at the General Assembly of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Kansas City. The words of Carol's son. I am a homosexual. I am not sick nor deviant, nor mentally ill. My sexuality simply expresses itself in attraction for other men rather than women. Neither is it unnatural. I am not attracted to children, nor pain, nor heterosexual men. For me, it is completely natural and right and good. If your morality would condemn me, first consider these things. I did not choose to be homosexual, but I found myself one and have accepted it happily as an integral part of my personality. The morality that could condemn me for something over which I have no control must itself be without humaneness, akin to the consciousness which gassed Jews and massacred in Indians. Homosexuals in this country and others have for centuries been forced to lead secretive lives in constant fear their careers would be destroyed and their relationships with their loved ones cut off by hate and disgust. I refuse to hate myself and I refuse to allow anyone who wishes to have continued personal contact with me to hate this essential part of myself either. I also refuse to live in a half world of gay ghettos where furtive sexual liaisons pass for love and self-revulsion and secretiveness are the prevailing mode. I do not live a life surrounded only by gay men. All my friends, both in Idaho and here, have for a long time accepted this facet of my personality without reservation knowing that I was a whole being, not divisible into acceptable and unacceptable parts. My two beautiful sisters have shown me only warmth and love and remarkable understanding, as I hope my brother will when he is old enough to comprehend the implications of the oppressive social stigma attached to my sexuality. I will not live a life of fear and shame. Too many important matters interest me to spend my life concerned with other people's unjust and inhumane moral prejudices. It is very important that you as parents not feel guilty because I, your son, am a homosexual. Guilt implies fault, and fault implies a misdeed. And I cannot consider myself as some mistake to be altered, if at all possible, and accepted only with resignation. I must ask you to accept me fully as a human being worthy of respect and trust and love. I am no less than any other human being simply because I am a homosexual. Finally, I hope that you can accept this part of me without resignation and regrets. I believe that your capacity to love can encompass the totality of myself and that you will know that I am the very same son that you have known for 21 years. 
If I disappoint you, I am sorry. But I cannot spend my life in apology. I must look to the future. And so must you. And that was the end of his letter. I have no idea if Carol Blakely was offended when her son first came out to her. I've never met her and know nothing of her story other than the letter I just shared with you that I knew nothing about until last summer. But the fact that she stood up at a microphone in front of thousands of fellow disciples at the General Assembly in 1977 and read this letter out loud tells me one thing. Whatever her initial reaction on this day, in 1977, she asked an entire church body to no longer take offense at her son. She joined him in asking herself and others not to be blinded by his gayness, but to see all of him and not just his sexual orientation. You know, isn't that what we do when we are offended by someone? I, I don't know about you, but I'll just, you know, in my own personal experience, when someone offends me, the first battle I have with myself is to remember that this is a complex individual and that I must not reduce them to the offense. That I cannot reduce them to whatever thing they have done or said or, or didn't say or didn't do that offended me. They're a human being, a child of God. And I cannot see only the offense. If that is all I see, no matter how offensive they are, I am the offender. It's what happened to Jesus that day in the synagogue. They reduced him to the offense. They, whether it was they didn't like what they heard from him or saw, that was it. It didn't matter what he said or do, did after that because they could not see beyond the offense. As the Bible tells us, they could, they could not see his miracles. They could not experience his power. They could not hear his truth. All they could see, all they could experience, all they could hear was the offense. And now I want to share with you one last version of the Bible. This is the old Amplified Bible. It was one of the first Bibles wasn't necessarily a paraphrase, it was more of a direct translation, but they would put in brackets the part that you might paraphrase. Like, here's what that really means. <laughs> okay. The old Amplified Bible. And they were, bracket, deeply offended by him. Bracket. And their disapproval blinded them to the fact that he was anointed by God as the Messiah. Their disapproval blinded them. Their disapproval was a blind spot. And Jesus, who opens the eyes of the blinds, even Jesus could not heal their blindness. Because it wasn't his blindness to heal. It was their disapproval that blinded them, and that was something that Jesus had no power over. And disapproval is a complex thing. We can't live without disapproval. We need disapproval or we'd all be dead by the time we're two, if not before. Many times disapproval is a very good thing that brings clarity, right? Helps us see the world and ourselves more clearly, make good decisions. But there are times, and we all know it, when our disapproval veils our eyes from seeing other people and even ourselves as we really are. To use Van Morrison's language, sometimes our disapproval glamours our vision. A fog, a veil, something opaque 
that does not let us see clearly. And the upshot of that, as in the text, is this limits God's power in our lives and in the world. You see, the Celtic peoples believed that there were thin places all over the place, be that the experience of the sun or the trees or a prayer in church or the fire or an interaction with another human being, the reading of scripture, prayers, all these thin places where the veil between heaven and earth was so thin, like gossamer, that you could reach through and touch the presence of God. But if the glamours are covering those thin places, you miss them. When I had to get bifocals two years ago, yeah, can I hear that again? Uh, but you know, thank God for bifocals, huh? Right? So I don't have to constantly be taking my glasses off. And of course, I wanted to get the kind without the lines. And my uh, my. Optician, Bernie Egan, great guy, best optician ever. He says to me, now Benny, it's going to take a few days for you to get used to these, and I need you to really pay attention to where you're stepping, because things are going to appear maybe differently than what they actually are, and you may misstep. I said, really? Like three days? Did I say that three days? It's going to take three days. I, he said, uh, he said, Benny, we're dealing with stronger powers now. <laughs> so it takes longer for your eyes to adapt. It takes three days to break a visual habit. Three days to break a visual habit. We're dealing with stronger powers now, so it takes longer to adapt. So keep that in mind. As you ponder what your blind spots are, the glamours that keep you from truly seeing yourself and others as they are, give yourself some time. It takes time to break these habits. Recognize you're dealing with some stronger powers within yourself. It's going to take longer for your body to adapt. I invite you, my friends, to be a dweller on the threshold with me. To use Van Morrison's words in his song, I'm a dweller on the threshold, I'm waiting at the door. I'm standing in the darkness and I don't want to wait no more. Let me pierce the realm of glamour so I know just who I am. Join me these weeks in piercing the glamours that blind you, that stall you at the threshold of function, and keep you and being who you really are. Join me now in prayer as we reach out to the God who opens the eyes of the world and ask for guidance that we may see as God has called us to see. I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and then after that, as we sing our prayer song, as always, you're invited to light a candle, to place a prayer in the prayer box. And today, I encourage you in your prayer to use the candle or the prayer box or the prayer you pray in your heart as you stay in your seat to see through the glamour and to have your blind spots healed. Thanks be to you, O oh God, that we've risen this day to the rising of life itself. May today be a day of blessing, 
a day of new beginnings given. Help us to avoid every dark spot and the source of every sin to forsake. As the mist scatters from the crust of the hills, may each ill haze clear from our souls, O oh God, that we may see and be seen.